Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a real honor to moderate this panel this afternoon. The topic is on sea power and maritime leadership. And I think we have some of the top experts in the field to address all of these issues. Uh, we will go in the order of the agenda, and we will start with um, Professor Carl Thayer. Professor Carl Thayer is Emeritus Professor at the University of New South Wales at the Australian Defence Force Academy. Carl is a true regional expert on Southeast Asia and has written extensively on the South China Sea. He lives and has lived in the region for many years, and so he will be able to give us truly an insider's perspective of Southeast Asia and of Asia writ large. Carl, thank you. Thank you, Toshi, and I benefited enormously from your lecture uh, this morning. I'd like to thank the Naval War College uh, for the invitation to visit here. This is my first time. Uh, my father was born in Providence, Rhode Island, but he was a West Pointer, which probably accounts for why I never got to set foot on this place. <laughs> My presentation is in uh, two parts and a conclusion. The first is going to look at the air-sea battle concept and its implication for Southeast Asia and America's alliance relations. Then I'm going to look at the, what I'm terming China's asymmetric challenges to maritime security in the South China Sea, but through legal warfare and changing the norms of uh, behavior on the sea rather than the military asymmetric warfare, and conclude with some comments about US leadership. On the air-sea battle concept, I thought I'd present a, an Australian view. Uh, this report by the De Department of Defense-funded think tank, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which I'll call ASPE. And it's called Planning the Unthinkable War, Air-Sea Battle and Its Implications for Australia. And that was published in April this year before the release of Australia's most recent defense white paper on the second, uh, 3rd of May. And the Air-Sea Battle Offices, Air-Sea Battle Service Collaboration to Address Anti-Access and Area Denial Challenges that was issued a week or so later. Before I get into that, there are some differences, but officially, if I could interpret U.S. policy, the Air-Sea Battle is a limited objective concept. It is not an operational plan or a strategy for a specific region or adversary. It deals with global anti-access area denial strategies. It aims at reducing risk, to preserving the US ability to project power and maintain freedom of action in the global commons. And the air-sea battle provides a range of options to counter aggression from the low end of the spectrum uh, to enable decision makers to conduct a show of force or conduct limited strikes uh, to the high end. And it also involves uh, integrating partners in that uh, uh, decision making. US investment in the capabilities identified in the air sea battle concept seeks to assure allies and partners and demonstrate the US will not retreat or submit to potential aggressors who would otherwise try and deny the international community the right to international waters and airspace. But this concept is combined with a much broader US government assistance and whole of government effort programs. Now I'm going to look specifically at how ASPE uh, treats the air sea battle. It argues that China's military modernization has already changed the military balance of power in the near seas, especially in the Taiwan Strait. It notes that the air sea battle is an operational concept that aims to deter and, if necessary, defeat the Chinese military. So it puts an adversary name in a way that the United States has officially refrained from doing so. The ASB aims, according to ASPE, to defeat the anti-axis era denial strategies by withstanding an initial Chinese attack and then conduct a blinding campaign <clears throat> against Chinese command and control networks, a missile suppression campaign against land-based systems, and a distant blockade against Chinese merchant ships. It's based on the assumption that escalation can be kept below the nuclear threshold. And it's also assumed, according to ASPE, that Japan and Australia will be active allies uh, throughout this campaign. ASPE's evaluation. It, it states that Australia should welcome it because it strengthens US conventional deterrence against China by developing a concept for operations in maritime zones contested by the People's Liberation Army Navy and the ASB makes a contribution to regional stability by promoting deterrence in the strategic relationship between the United States and China. But the ASP report goes on to make criticisms, and leaving aside the funding questions, uh, 
uh, they put them at the strategic level. It has been given enormous publicity. The Chief of uh, Naval Operations, Admiral Jonathan Greenert, is quoted as the air-sea battle is a centerpiece of the Navy's pivot to Asia. And so it's why the ASB is widely viewed as a US effort to contain China, in spite of repeated US denials. It is unclear how the air-sea battle fits in with broader US grand strategic framework. We've heard that repeatedly here at this forum to address China's how, in a broad strategic framework, should the US and allies address China's military rise. In fighting China, there are no good options. Conflict will lead to stalemate. What is the relationship, then, between the air-sea battle use in conflict and the political objectives of that conflict? What is it that the US is seeking to achieve? Now, yesterday, we were given the dichotomy of wrestling or dancing with China. Regional states, including Australia, do not want to make a choice, either the US or China. They want a US grand strategy that enables them to develop relations with both. Air-sea battle is optimized for high-intensity conventional war between China and the United States and its allies. It applies, argues Aspie, in only in extreme cases, a Chinese attack on, on Taiwan, missile attacks on Japan or US military bases in East Asia, or the sinking of an aircraft carrier. And most trenchantly, air-sea battle faces the challenge of potential nuclear escalation. Deep penetrating attacks on the Chinese mainland to disrupt command and control nodes could provoke a disproportionate Chinese response. China might perceive such attacks as undermining its nuclear deterrent and miscalculate by taking preemptive action, including nuclear escalation. And as I'll argue later in the paper, the air-sea battle concept does not address more likely scenarios, such as Chinese coercive actions in territorial disputes in the South China Sea. The air-sea battle con implementation includes conducting engagement activities to build uh, conceptual alignment and partner capacity and to strengthen relationships. So what, how does the ASB fit with allies' perceptions? And, and I have to do just a snapshot of each because it's, uh, I've got 50, 20 minutes. Japan is seen as a key enabler by the ASB report, and it's not particularly concerned about being entrapped in the U.S. Uh, alliance relationship because the pressures from China are so immense at the moment. And Japan can augment U.S. forces in selected mission areas, particularly submarine and air-based anti-submarine warfare, maritime ISR, maritime strike, defensive escort, and ballistic missile defense. And Japan is already in the initial phases of shifting towards complementarity with the air-sea battle concept, and they have a direct interest in its success. Less so South Korea and, and Taiwan. For South Korea, the air-sea battle presents an unwanted risk of being drawn into a conflict with China and having the Republic of Korea's territory uh, targeted, if, particularly if China attempts to strike US forces there. Nonetheless, the Republic of Korea is concerned over potential Chinese dominance in Northeast Asia and in its own turn is beginning to develop a pretty robust blue water navy. Its main concern is being drawn in by working with Japan at present, uh, given their differences. So it's unlikely, uh, argues the ASPA report, that South Korea will offer its support for an air-sea battle concept unless uh, relations with China deteriorate markedly. <clears throat> As for Taiwan, well, that's the centerpiece of what air-sea battle really is about, argues ASPE. A U.S.-China war over Taiwan is the heart of the problem to be addressed. Therefore, Taiwan can be expected to play a key role in the ASB. Taiwan is moving to, to more asymmetric defense posture to deny China, the mainland China the approaches to the island. Those are frontline states. Now, Australia, and I think this is an important message from a major US ally, is not a frontline state. It's seen as a preferred US partner. It's a reliable political ally. It has a good geographic, uh, geostrategic position, and the Australian Defence Force, the ADF, is of high standard. So what can Australia contribute, and Aspie says, strategic depth. It can give access to the Marine Air Ground Task Force and U.S. long-range long uh, strike aircraft. That could be an integral part of operations of the air-sea battle concept in Southeast Asia. 
Australia could provide a supportive role with rear guard actions for forward deployed US troops. It could provide tanker aircraft freeing up others. It could provide airborne early warning and control, uh, electronic warfare, and that would free US assets. Australia could also provide long range strike capability, offensive strike operations in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific. And it could contribute to those peripheral campaigns, the maritime interdiction of Chinese merchant and, and energy shipping if necessary. But, the Aspe report argues, fully embracing the logic behind the air-sea battle or developing specific military capabilities to underpin the concept's implementation are so far not in Australia's interest. Why? It sends a strong message to China that the ADF is actively planning and equipping for a potential war with the PLA. Australia prefers a US grand strategy aimed at integrating China into a competitive Asian security uh, order at the same time as balancing Chinese military power. So on military uh, capabilities, one of the questions that has to be asked in Australia is the cost of interoperability as the US develops these high-end uh, fighting capabilities and, and across the various domains. The 2013 Defense White Paper, which came after this report, calls for Australia to manufacture 12 Australian-designed and built follow-on column-class conventional submarines that would carry uh, cruise missiles. 12 Boeing EA-18 Growler fighters, 72 Lockheed Martin Stealth Joint Strike Fighters, two Australian-built supply ships, and 24 new Australian-built patrol boats. But the government and the opposition, which is expected to win the September elections, have not indicated where the funding will come from. And Australia is now at 1937 levels uh, of defense spending. So the recommendations that is Australia should call on the US to develop an Asia Pacific strategy to provide an overarching framework for the air sea battle concept. It should provide a clear message on how it intends to deal with China's growing military power and what role the air-sea battle will play in it. There is no need for the government or defense, argues the Aspie report, to publicly endorse the air-sea battle. At this point, and I'm quoting, we, Australia, don't have an interest in signaling to China that the ADF is preparing for a future military conflict with the PLA. In the unlikely event of a war with China, Australia could not only provide the US with greater strategic depth, but also contribute ADF military niche capabilities without having officially signed up for air-sea battle. Um, in the vernacular, perhaps a bob either way. Uh, don't endorse it, but work with it and support it uh, for the larger political ends of not attacking China. So it, it, but Australia needs to seek clarification of the role of the Marine Air Ground Task Force and uh, U.S. Air Force uh, elements uh, rotating through Australian bases. What point would they play in an air-sea battle context? How would they be used in the event of conflict? And Australia should study the implication of integration of the Australian Defence Force into a Southeast Asia air-sea battle framework uh, operating with U.S. forces. Now, if we look at Southeast Asia, uh, it becomes prominent in air-sea battle as, as a part of the peripheral campaign, a distant blockade of, of Chinese forces and sea lines of communications by controlling joint, uh, choke points and anti-submarine warfare. From the barrier from the Ryukyu Islands in the north to the Luzon Strait, but in Southeast Asia along the Philippine Islands to the southern exits of the South China Sea. So regional states look to, to the U.S. for support as part of hedging strategies against a more assertive China, but do not want to be roped into battle planning against China. And it's unclear how the ASB would apply to their territorial disputes. The Philippines, which is at the bo very bottom end of the scale and is modernizing, can offer facilities, bases, to be used by U.S. Navy, Air Force, and Marines to operate in the South China Sea. It's building up its own very low-level A2, AD uh, capabilities from a low base. It's not much that the Philippines other than the facilities that it could provide. Singapore, the government would think twice before committing to an air-sea battle operational concept that could involve Singapore in a major war with China. But if the strategic environment deteriorated, Singapore would become a, an important U.S. partner. It presently hosts the literal combat ships, and its Navy and Air Force are of high standing. Vietnam 
is unlikely to provide any facilities for the United States. And in this ASPE report, they're quoting my own work, and I'm a Vietnam specialist, and not a Vietnam War specialist, a Vietnam specialist, uh, to make the case. It's building up its own A2, uh, AD capabilities. It's getting kilo-class submarines, stealth frigates, uh, all from Russia. Uh, it prefers the US to do the heavy lifting and having Vietnam stand back and, and watch the US do the containing. Indonesia's uh, strategic uh, location ideally places it to play a role of air-sea battle uh, is part of the distant blockades, but politically it's unlikely to commit. So the potential for ASB initiatives in Southeast Asia are much more limited than in Northeast Asia. Now in the time remaining, I want to quickly address the asymmetric threats. In the paper, and for interest of time, I'll abbreviate this and get on to my main point, that China has built up the South China fleet and is putting its most modern combatants. It has a headquarters on the mainland. It's built up a major base on Hainan Island, which is, well, is host to nuclear submarines and increasingly in the future ballistic submarines. Further south of the Paracels, it's built up uh, air facilities. It's wired and connected all its occupied features in the South China Sea the land features as well as the mobile uh, navy and, and paramilitary forces, uh, and the air-sea battle, in a sense, would attempt, for example, if cruise missiles are, in fact, on Woody Island in the Paracels, to address that threat to freedom of navigation and maneuver during times of conflict. But what China has done is, in the Pentagon reports the Congress have been illustrating this for several years, uh, is practicing legal warfare. They pass laws that restrict American activities in their exclusive economic zones, which we heard about the other day, uh, anti-succession laws for Taiwan. And any time an incident occurs, they argue it never happened, the other side's lying, or China is merely going about its peaceful maritime enforcement activities. Now these, uh, in terms of the Philippines, has resulted in the annexation of Scarborough Shoal that was the Phil it was an American target in the sighting post during the air, air war against Vietnam. Uh, they've lost it when the Philippines sent a former Coast Guard vessel to apprehend Chinese who were fishermen who were fishing and poaching illegally. They were intercepted by Chinese maritime surveillance ships and prevented from carrying out the arrest, and these ships have not left. The US tried to broker a mutual withdrawal. The Philippines withdrew, the Chinese stayed, and they've got it and they've declared a no-go zone virtually and prevent Filipino fishermen from going there, and, and they've stationed ships around the shoal, it's theirs. A second incident has now emerged in Aigun, or Second Thomas Shoal, where in 1999, the Philippines imaginatively beached an LST and have kept a small group of Marines to maintain Philippine sovereignty over that. China now claims that they're illegally occupying Chinese territory, have brought a frigate, and usually the PLAN has not been involved in, in any of these exercises, and maritime vessels, and have put pressure on the Philippines to withdraw. The Philippines are worried that the Marines will not be able to be resupplied and therefore have to withdraw like its vessels did in Scarborough Shoal. So what I'm arguing is that so far, I, uh, the US can aid the Philippines in building up domain awareness, can help develop ca capacity. That's gonna take years to bring about, but it's the here and now and the encroachment. And the Philippines has taken its case to a UN arbitral tribunal to make certain decisions, and that's probably causing China to respond to consolidate its position. And in, in Vietnam's case, uh, when the Obama administration came to office, it, it found out that uh, U.S. oil companies willing to assist Vietnam were being pressured not to involve in, uh, in commercial operations, and they sent two Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Defense to Congress, made a very strong point that uh, the U.S. is going to resist those pressures. They've cut foreign uh, seismic vessels, ca the cables conducting surveys in Vietnam's waters, and they play pretty hard ball with their fishermen. That's a problem for Vietnam. So throughout the region, the, the, and they've conducted exercises, military exercises, fine, but more recent ones have seen scenarios in which a Chinese surveillance ship is accosted by a foreign surveillance ship, and the scenarios are worked out by sending PLA and frigates, aircraft, to the area to solve the problem. Uh, which is a, a potent uh, intimidation. And all the argument is on a legal basis, which muddies the water 
and it's not involving warships. And I don't think we, I call it asymmetric because I haven't yet seen a regional or a US suggested or led response uh, uh, to that. So let me conclude by looking at, uh, in the last minute here, future global maritime leadership. It is clear that the majority of regional states support a clear role for US in leading uh, in regional maritime security affairs. These states do not, however, want to make a choice between China and the US, but they support strongly the US deterrent role against the rise of, of uh, coercive Chinese military power. Regional states prefer to see the US adopt a grand strategy that engages China and draw it into a constructive role uh, by adhering to established norms and rules of the road to support providing security for the regional commons. The ASPE report argues that the US should develop an alternate concept to the air-sea battle, one that stresses and plays on American strengths to deny Chinese access to the contested areas inside that first island chain as being a much more appropriate strategy that doesn't bear the risk of escalation. Regional states would like the United States and China to become enmeshed in multilateral security organizations such as the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus and the East Asia Summit. The US and its partners should promote norms and legal regimes, codes of conduct, and practical activities in the multilateral organizations, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ADMM Plus Expert Working Groups, the East Asia Summit. And the US could obtain, play a role in obtaining regional consensus on streamlining the regional security architecture so that when heads of state meet at the East Asia Summit, they can look at proposals served up by defense ministers and act on them. And finally, U.S. leadership is needed to counter China's resort to legal warfare. And what I hear personally, sequestration has meant that brilliant U.S. lawyers, JAG, and people here at this war college uh, have trouble traveling. And their voices needed to be heard. I was recently at two different conferences and all American defense officials were pulled out because of lack of, of funding. And their voices need to be heard and heard strongly. They are the, they're the people that have been on ships, know the law of the sea, and can make ar convincing counter arguments to China's legal claims. And they can be joined by Australians and others. But this, we must not let the information domain in this area be dominated by China. And finally, um, uh, you know, this challenge their use of civilian fishing fleets, et cetera. So the US is implementing long range plans to enhance the maritime dom domain awareness and capacity building, and that's well regarded in the region. But China is currently attempting to undermine the Philippine sovereignty, and its challenge also raises questions about the credibility of U.S. security guarantees. And that's why we need a strategy uh, to deal uh, with what I call the asymmetric Chinese attempt to push its control uh, over, over features in the South China Sea uh, through, the, through paramilitary and private civilian fishing fleets. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thayer. Our next speaker is Professor Andrew Lambert, who is Lawton Professor of Naval History in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. His most recent books include The Crimean War, British Grand Strategy Against Russia, 1853 to 1856, and The Challenge, Britain versus America in the Naval War of 1812. Professor? Thank you very much, Tashi. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I thought I'd stand because it's just a nice lectern to stand behind, and it means if you throw things at me, I can duck. I have to thank the organizers of the forum, uh, I have to thank the Admiral, I have to thank uh, John Mara and others for bringing me over here and giving me the chance to engage with this uh, very friendly and positive audience. This afternoon, what I'd like to do is to do something that Mahan used to do when he was here and that is to examine the underlying realities of the last great sea power empire. Mahan's work was in part an homage and in part an emulation of a country that he admired and above all of a service that he considered the exemplar in the field of naval activity. He wished the USA to emulate that kind of navy, to build up a great navy, and of course his dream would come true. Up to a point, uh, Mahan's relationship with the Royal Navy was very close, but he was always an American patriot. Uh, so he's a man who understands the value of a good example, but also the importance of differentiating between that example and what his own country will actually need to do, uh, which will be professionally to the same standard, but it will have to be an American and not a British type force. <clears throat> 
Mahan's case studies, long and detailed as they are, have often been ignored by uh, the argument that they finish in the age of sail in 1815, that the world has moved, that technology has changed, and that people who write about such antique things don't have anything to say to the future. And what I'm going to do today, really, is to, to carry on Mahan very quickly, unlike Mahan, who didn't do anything very quickly, uh, and go over um, what the British did for the next 100 years. My opening gambit, of course, is something that John Mara threw up for us yesterday when he introduced the, the paper, uh, the page, and that was, of course, the Battle of Waterloo. At the end of that 22-year cycle of Anglo-French conflict in which everybody else in Europe got involved and the United States got involved too. At Waterloo, Napoleon was soundly beaten by the new Carthaginians, a nation that he and most other Frenchmen derided as mere sea traders and merchants, and therefore neither particularly warlike nor particularly likely to win, because surely in that story the Romans always win. Everybody wants to play the Romans, nobody wants to play the Carthaginians. But by 1815, the British were saying, you know what, we are the new Carthaginians, only this time we've won. We are the winners in this. J.M.W. Turner, the great artist of Englishness, painted a series of images of the Carthaginians in which he said, you know what, we are winning this war, we are going to win it, and we'll celebrate it by pointing out that we are different. Uh, his great contribution, the Fighting Temeraire, was a celebration of the sheer greatness of that achievement. Such a small country to beat such a vast empire. Between Waterloo and the opening of World War I in August 1914, a run of 99 years, Great Britain ran a unique global empire using a mix of naval, economic and diplomatic power, not military power, applied with relatively high levels of consistency to sustain a favourable world order within which Britain would grow and prosper. It did so through deterrence, arms racing and the possession of clear strategic concepts. And I stress the word concepts because Britain never had a strategic plan. British strategy was invariably reactive. Britain was not going to attack anybody about anything. It was going to react to other people doing things that Britain did not wish to see happening. The fact that this went on for so long in a world increasingly militarized, increasingly nationalized, and increasingly aggressive, when wars of national unity, uh, wars for the conquest of large parts of continental territory were being waged, is truly remarkable when you understand that Britain is less than half the size of France. Britain, the only global power of the 19th century, is a tiny, tiny country by comparison with its continental neighbors at the time. In sum, Britain had clear core strategic principles. And I'll go through these as a checklist because that's the quickest way to do it. First of all, maintain the balance of power in Europe. This is absolutely fundamental. The reason the War of 1812 finished at the Treaty of Ghent on the 24th of December 1814 was so the British could concentrate on the Vienna Congress where the future of the world would be settled. They did something very important. They kept these two processes separate. They insisted on maintaining their maritime belligerent rights regime, and they refused to discuss issues like impressment or trade regulations with the Americans, the French, or the Russians. After that, they prepared to talk about anything. That was a red line. Everything else could be talked about. Secondly, critical to British security is the stability and independence and integrity of a small Belgian state. If you want to invade England in the 19th century, you will be coming up the Scheldt River, coming out of Antwerp. If Belgium is part of France, Britain is permanently at war with France. The cause of war in 1793 was a French invasion of what we call Belgium. So creating a Belgian state in 1815, recreating it in a new guise in 1830, and in 1870, keeping the Franco-Prussian War out of Belgium, fundamental red lines for British strategy. If a hegemonic European state occupies Belgium, they will be at war with Britain, and they know that. Third, control the world ocean through the possession of a two-power battle fleet. That might sound heretical here, where you probably have a 10-power battle fleet, uh, but a two-power battle fleet. Pick your two biggest potential enemies, total them up, and build a fleet at least as big as they are, and reckon on your guys being better than their guys. That'll, that's enough. Britain is a minimal security state, not a maximal security state. It very rarely had a full two-power standard. We relied on the Russians being very, very poor, and never being able to mobilize their full strength. <clears throat> 
Fourth, dominate communications. Not just commercial communications, but intelligence, the flow of news uh, and information. It was no coincidence that the British pioneered ocean-going steam navigation. They pioneered the submarine telegraph cable, the wireless network, and of course the World Wide Web more recently. Uh, the British like to see the world because their own country is so small they have to go abroad to find something interesting to look at. Um, you have a bigger country, you have more choice. Um, I've heard some very interesting regional humor, um, both here and down in Maryland, on this trip. Uh, critically, keep the old world, the new world, Asia and Africa separate. Do not allow these things to collide. Sea power allows you to keep continents apart. And if you can maintain that sea power, you can keep the Americans in the American hemisphere and the French in the European hemisphere, and that reduces your problems. That is what Vienna and Ghent are all about. These last three points all seek economic growth through world trade to satisfy the economic and in part the political ambitions of a growing population. The money is being used to pay off the British national debt. The cost of war between 1793 and 1815 is astronomical. Uh, we're worried about costs today. They are pitiful compared to the costs the British state faced in 1815. But Britain was still able to borrow lots of money very cheaply, and over the long 19th century, the British paid down their national debt by three quarters. And that was the single largest budget item throughout the period 1815 to 1914, paying down and servicing the national debt. This meant avoiding another Napoleonic total war. Britain is not a total war state. It doesn't profit from total war, and it doesn't wish to wage them. It tries to avoid them through deterrence, and when that failed, in the case of the Crimean War in 1854, the British did not wage a total war against Russia. They waged a very limited maritime campaign. They brought the Russians down to the beach and beat them up there. Only a Frenchman or a German or indeed a Swede would invade Russia and march on Moscow. This is folly. You know, if you want to lose your army, march on Moscow. Uh, it's an oxymoron. The British use limited war because they can't use total war. If the British were going to mobilize for a total war with Russia in 1854, they'd have had to change their constitution, their electoral system, and the structure of the state, and they weren't going to do that. They would rather fight a limited war and accept limited gains. Point seven, coercive diplomacy to open markets. Countries that won't trade with the British in the 19th century tend to get the rough edge of British diplomacy. Uh, two wars with China, they're about trade access. The Chinese won't trade, the British go and beat them up a bit and open up their ports. In 1854, we picked sides in the Crimean War on trade basis. Russia is a high tariff country. Turkey is a no tariff country. We back the Turks. We trade with the Turks. We lend capital to the Turks. We're going to defend Turkey, a Muslim country, against Christian Russia because the Turks are better for business. That's why we weren't overly bothered who won the Civil War because we didn't like the Southerners on the slavery question and we didn't like the Northerners because they were a very high tariff economy. Uh, the US government is a high tariff protectionist economy in the 1850s and 60s and that's bad for British business. If you want to be friends with the British, trade with them. If you don't want to be friends, don't trade with them. The abolition of the slave trade, piracy, privateering and all other forms of non-state violence at sea. This is good for the insurance market. It means that world shipping is cheaper and cheaper. After 1815, very few people put guns on their merchant ships because the world ocean is a safer place. That's not the British being good. That's the British doing good business for their own commercial and economic and political interests. They will tell you, as Hugh reminded us this morning, this is some kind of liberal good agenda. It's not. You know, it serves Britain's interest to have a safe open sea which can be used by cheap merchant shipping. Nine, ultimately trade land for sea control, an empire of ports, bases, communication hubs, cable telegraph links, and above all else, dry docks. If you want to understand the British Empire, look where the dry docking accommodation is. That is the British Empire, right down to 1945. If there's a big dry dock, it's an important place. Ten, if you're going to fight anybody, wage economic war, something Mahan stressed in the second sea power volume. It's all about the economic war. Trafalgar, Economic war, Napoleon beaten. Control costs. This has to be done on the cheap. Britain has spent a lot of money and the population will not stand for 
large, expensive defense or large, expensive war. In fact, the cost of paying for the Napoleonic Wars was higher than the cost of paying for defense for much of the 19th century. Ultimately, Britain got very rich and very powerful, but in August 1914, it failed to understand the crisis. It did not attempt to deter, and having already outraced the Germans in naval armaments, it was in a position to issue a strong warning, and it failed to do so. It wasn't the question whether deterrence would or would not have worked in 1914. They didn't even try, and that is the catastrophe. They then blundered into a conflict and fought it in a way which is entirely un-English. They raised a mass army and fought the main enemy army in the decisive theater of war. The British had never done this before since the Middle Ages when we had longbows and the French had armored horsemen. It wrecked our system, it damaged our population, and it had a serious impact on the way we thought about the world ever after. My key point here is that the sea power model, the British Empire, was working down to 1914. The economy is growing. Uh, the British are dominant in investment, overseas investment, shipbuilding, shipping and services. They have a world position, which is remarkably strong. The United States, it's important to note that historically aware states through history have always realized that decline is a fact of life. Nothing despite what the Chinese you tell you is forever. All powers will decline at some stage in some way. And we should be careful not to speculate in one-sided ways. It's all very well to be concerned about what America is not doing right, but we can learn some interesting lessons from what other people didn't do right either. The British spent much of the 19th century examining how and why other great powers declined. They became slightly obsessive about it. Uh, they studied the Athenians, the Venetians, the Romans, the Dutch, the Portuguese. And these texts were familiar. They were familiar to students here, and they're actually in the library. Uh, they were familiar to Mahan, too. Poor decision-making, however, will bring you down. If you make bad decisions, you can wreck your system. In 1914, Great Britain held a great deal of American paper. In 1918, America held a great deal of British paper. Uh, and that is the real story of World War I. The failure to deter Germany in 1914 proved costly, and with that, the, true, the last true sea power, great power, was set for oblivion. By 1945, the United States had wrecked the British economic and political system across the world as part of the war aims of the, of the period. Britain was broken up, its economic system was ended, and we have been rather free riding ever since because we haven't got any money. Uh, we finished paying those debts we owed you about three years ago. So if you want the British to help you, um, the money thing is actually quite important. We do need some. Yeah. Great Britain was never a superpower. It never had the manpower, the scale, or the intention of being a continental superpower on the scale of the United States, the Soviet Union, China, and other states we often talk about. It was a very weak, small, resource-dependent state. It was a sea power not because it got power at sea, but because it was so weak that if it ever lost the sea, it would be starved. Admiral Fisher said this, 1904, if we lose control of the sea, it's not invasion we have to fear, but starvation, and he underlined it three times, and nothing has changed, apart from the fact that we now have no food supplies in Britain at all. If the sea stopped working tomorrow, we would be eating each other by the weekend. We have no food supplies. We also have no fuel reserves, so we'd be doing it in the dark, and we wouldn't be able to cook each other either. Yep. So you can learn something from Britain, but you have to be very careful you don't learn too much because the wrong, the, you can get the wrong lessons from the British. Uh, they did what they did because of who they were and where they operate. The United States, by contrast, in the modern age, is not a classic sea power. It's not resource dependent on overseas. Uh, it could manage quite nicely without the ocean and increasingly has a grand strategy that looks towards managing very nicely without. It is a unique naval power uh, it is probably the only continental state that has maintained a navy of this strength uh, and size if in a prolonged period of relative peace uh, in world history, certainly since the Romans. Uh, and I would often say that the United States Navy and the Roman Imperial Navy are two very similar navies. They are the navies of great, powerful states which use them as tools of power uh, rather than for the protection of something uh, as tedious as trade. Uh, the United States doesn't flag its own merchant ships. It lets other people do that. 
The difference is that between the ideas of Sir Julian Corbett and Alfred Thayer Mahan. Mahan is, is already talking about naval strategy in 1911, and Corbett is talking about maritime strategy. These are different strategies. Britain always maritime, using naval power for maritime ends. Thalassocracy, the, the command of the sea, is about power and weakness. And remember, the Greeks associate the sea, Thalassa, with death. If you get too far out at sea, you will die and you will not come back. So it's not an entirely positive thing we're talking about here. Sea power is sea weakness. If you are a real sea power, you can die by the sea as much as you can live by it. When Britain lost her strength, her sea empire evaporated like a dream, leaving behind little more than a memory, Shakespeare, and that wonderful game, cricket. Uh, but Britain remains a sea power. It's just not a great power, because it cannot be anything else. Certain countries have to be sea powers. Modern Japan is a classic example. Dependence on the sea in ways that continental states simply do not comprehend makes you think about the sea in different ways. Britain is now a medium power, if at best, reliant on allies and coalitions. But it is significantly, in the 21st century, building its first large deck fleet aircraft carriers since 1945. Two 65,000 ton carriers are in build and one will be at sea quite soon. Britain has a sea power future. It is not as a great power, but it is certainly a globally engaged maritime state. When the Australians went into East Timor, a battalion of Gurkhas and a British air warfare destroyer were part of that operation. You can't get much further from the United Kingdom uh, than the north coast of Australia, apart, of course, from the south coast of Australia, which is an awful long way from the north coast if you've ever made that. That journey. And Britain is globally engaged and globally capable. The Falklands War is not really that long ago. Um, that was when I finished my PhD, and I realized that General Galtieri had probably saved my intellectual career. And he was followed by Mikhail Gorbachev, who completely resurrected it by ending the Cold War. Ultimately, Britain was and is, as Sir John Seeley remarked in 1882, a world Venice with the oceans for streets. Mahan knew that because he'd read that book. He was engaged in that debate at that time. He met people like Seeley. He talked about these ideas. Seeley's book was in the library here, and he referenced it. The past is the only resource we have that allows us to understand these issues in the round and get to the end of the problem. Everything we look at today, thinking about tomorrow, we don't know. We don't know. There are intangibles. We can work these things right through to the end. We can see where the mistakes were. We can pick out how these processes operate, and we can get a really good understanding of something rather than hoping we understand something that we can't be certain about. If we recognize differences and emphasize that no two great powers are ever the same, but understand some of those underlying realities, it offers answers, not answers in the sense of what to do next, but answers in the sense of ideas that will help you to encapsulate, develop, and think about the future. If you know how your precursors handled these issues, you'll be better equipped to face them yourselves. So I would say it's an exemplary past, not one to copy, one to follow, or one to think of as a prediction, but one to learn from, one to think about, one to ponder on. Different states using similar tools, but the one thing that links them is two outstanding professional navies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lambert. Our next speaker is Professor James Kurth. He is Professor of Political Science Emeritus and Senior Research Scholar at Swarthmore College. He was a visiting professor of strategy at the Naval War College here, and he is currently a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and was the editor of leading journal Orbis. Professor Kurth. Thank you. In fact, we'll uh, conclude. That is to say, I'm going to draw from uh, pieces and bits and bricks from earlier presentations, try to weave them together uh, as a kind of summary to our conference, and also uh, pointing to our last topic here, 21st century sea power and global maritime leadership. Now, one of the themes of our conference, just reiterated a few minutes ago, was the relationship between our understanding of history and the present and the future. Uh, and therefore, it's kind of useful, I think, to imagine how 21st century sea power and global maritime leadership might be looked at if we were imagining stepping back 
into history, indeed stepping back to a century. Imagine that there was a conference, more likely uh, in London or in Greenwich than in uh, Newport at that particular point, but imagine there was a conference in 1913, 100 years ago, with the title or the topic, 20, 20th Century Sea Power and Global Maritime Leadership. And notice what the analysis would look like at the time. Well, focusing on power defined as uh, great weapon systems, the focus would be on battleships. Surely that will be the center of power in the 20th century. But very shortly thereafter, that is to say a year or two th thereafter, World War II would show that submarines were more important, and wo World War I would show that submarines were more important, and World War II would show that carriers were more important than battleships. So the understanding that people would have had in, 2000, in 1913 probably probably wouldn't have quite captured what would be the core weapon system in defining sea power. Now suppose we look at power defined as great naval powers rather than great weapon systems. There, of course, uh, the understanding of 1913 would be that the great naval powers were the United Kingdom, plus the United States, plus Germany and Japan, a form of one plus X, as, um, as our initial speaker, uh, William Wuther, was referring to. Uh, but it turned out that this particular formulation, one plus X in particular, one plus three, was in fact confirmed largely by World War I. Germany was a major power, a naval power, as were the others. It was defeated. Uh, but then the remaining three powers are conformed, confirmed in the Washington and London naval treaties um, of the interwar period. And then once again, those four powers were the major naval powers of World War II. So if we were taking the predictions or understandings of 1913, we would have got the future partly wrong and partly right. Now let's turn to the other part of our topic, the 20th century global uh, maritime leadership from the point of view of 1913. In 1913, people would look back, just as a moment ago, Andrew Lambert looked back, on the 19th century, the British century. And this was a century of British maritime supremacy, not just leadership, in virtually every sea as well as every ocean. Uh, however, by the first part of the 20th century, Britain was being forced to cede, and we've discussed about this uh, in various uh, earlier panels, maritime supremacy to first the United States in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, second to Japan um, uh, in the, uh, in the um, East Asia or the Western Pacific. But in this particular case, they ceded supremacy but replaced it with an alliance, a partnership while retaining leadership. In other words, from supremacy to leadership. In regard to France, not one of the major naval powers, they did something similar. They ceded uh, supremacy in the Mediterranean, but with a close alliance in which they retained leadership. And then with, of course, Germany, they did not confront it with mere ceding, that is say accommodation, retrenchment, or appeasement over the United States, alliance, partnership, uh, as they did with Japan and France, but full containment, containment and confrontation with Germany in the North Sea. So when Britain faced a challenge to its ability uh, to maintain global maritime supremacy and had to devolve and diminish itself while tell, still trying to remain, uh, retain global maritime leadership, and it did that in three different ways. Uh, now, turning now to 21st century sea power, well, if you look at power as weapon systems, of course, I think it would be natural that in 2013, now at a conference at the Naval War College, we would focus on the importance of carriers, but also submarines, especially attack and nuclear, submar nuclear missile submarines. But just as carriers displace battleships in the 20th century, is it possible that land-launch anti-ship missiles will displace carriers? 
uh, as I heard Yoshi, uh, Toshi Yoshihara's presentation earlier today, and I suppose almost everybody in this room has heard it, either as a student here at the college or as a guest at this conference, as I heard him today, the Chinese are developing a very effective capacity in which they believe that land-launched anti-ship missiles will indeed displace, indeed sink, U.S. carriers. Now, just as submarines proved to be an effective anti-commerce system uh, in the 20th century, not predicted, is it possible that cyber attacks may prove to be an anti-commerce, anti-economic system in the 21st century? In other words, is it possible that our understanding of what are the central, central weapon systems of, um, of uh, sea power uh, might be just as short-sighted as our counterparts would have found them 100 years ago? Now, when we turn to the other question, uh, power as great naval powers, well, do we have a version of 1 plus X or 1 plus 1? Well, clearly, we do have the U.S., and clearly, given our discussion and given what Professor Yoshiharwa has discussed, and I incidentally agree with virtually everything that he has said and written, uh, given all of that, surely it's one plus two. Are the other naval powers up to the level of a full digit? I don't think so, but they can provide certain local threats, as Iran and the Persian Gulf. Uh, but now turning to the 21st century global maritime leadership, uh, that's a very important topic. In the second half of the 20th century, the American century, uh, the U.S. achieved uh, maritime supremacy, supremacy in virtually every seas as well as every ocean, just like the British had in much of the, of the 19th century. And uh, uh, we know that that was essentially identified as recently in the uh, cooperative maritime strategy for the 21st century uh, as a goal for the 21st century of the U.S. Navy. But even in the golden age uh, of the uh, United States uh, uh, maritime supremacy, global maritime supremacy, not just leadership, there were four minor exceptions to that general proposition that uh, we had supremacy in virtually every sea as well as the oceans. And those four American exceptions were the very near seas to the Soviet Union during the uh, Cold War. Uh, seas that were so near and so remote from us and our consciousness that hardly anybody knows much about them except specialists in the Navy. The Barents Sea, the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea, and the Sea of Okhotsk. For the most part, we assumed that the Soviets had effective denial capability in those seas. We did not really uh, claim to assert uh, supremacy there. Now, turning to the first part of the 21st century at our conference in 2013, what do we see? Now, the United States' global maritime supremacy in all seas as well as oceans faces its most formidable challenge from China, as several of our speakers, uh, Professor Lane, Professor McDougall, and Professor Yoshihara have repeatedly demonstrated. I should say this is obviously a controversial issue, even amongst the panel uh, giver, the, the various presentations, but I fully agree with the position uh, given out by uh, Professor Lane, McDougall, and Yoshihara. And of course, therefore, in particular, uh, China poses challenges in the three littoral seas, um, its near sea, as they would call it, or underlying its extension from land, its maritime territories, as they call it, its core interests, as they call it, the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the Yellow, or what they sometimes call the North China Sea, the Three China Seas. And of course, as we know, most recently from uh, Professor Thayer's presentation, uh, in these seas, there are, these seas contain islands or even islets involving conflict, which in turn involve US allies, the Philippines, Japan, and Taiwan. And within the Yellow or North China Sea, 
the islands, are, such as they are, are matters of conflict between North Korea and South Korea, not South Korea and China, but we do know whenever the U.S. engages in big ship, capital ship, naval operations in the Yellow Seas, the Chinese engage in a great deal of criticism and complaint. And of course, these islands that we've just been mentioning, Japan, South Korea, uh, Philippines, uh, and Taiwan, with a much more ambiguous relationship with us, those islands form what, as Professor Yoshihara has pointed out, the first island chain, which Ch China sees as the boundary of the three China seas. And to secure these three seas and to neutralize the first island chain is, of course, one of their premier objectives. Now, given this challenge to uh, United States global maritime supremacy, in those three littoral seas, Professors Lane and Professor McDougall counsel some form of accommodation or retrenchment. But Professors Warthart and, uh, and um, uh, Dove Zockheim focus on the U.S. alliance and security guarantees and counsel containment and deterrence. Others in our discussions in the last day or two have reminded us of the centrality and necess necessity of alliances for global maritime powers. And so we do have a fundamental challenge, including a fundamental division, within the participants in this conference about what should be done about this challenge to U.S. global maritime supremacy as brought down to the level of the three China Seas. Let me suggest some historical and analogical context for these challenges as viewed by Americans and especially as viewed by the Chinese. Now, the course is a U.S. historical analogy to a growing continental power reaching out to claim two littoral territorial seas for its own and for the most practical purposes deny access to other naval powers. And this was, of course, the case in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century as we took over and extended our control over the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean. This analogy is well known to the Chinese. There's also a Chinese historical analogy they not only have their contemporary terms about these three littoral seas, near seas, maritime, territory, core interest, but there is a earlier Chinese conception that these seas were a natural part of Chung Kuo, the central kingdom, the great land uh, civilization, but there were natural, uh, the seas were a natural part of that. If you take the ancient Chinese capital of Xi'an, somewhat southwest of Beijing, uh, the capital of the original uh, Chinese dynasties, and you take a compass and draw a great circle from that, you will encompass most of the lands uh, of the Qing dynasty, all the way from Manchuria to the north, all of Mongolia, uh, Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, it, down into the borders with India and ending up with Vietnam and Anam uh, down there uh, in the south. Uh, you would also include Korea, the Ryukyus, which the Chinese called the Luchus, and you would encompass the three littoral seas. The Chinese conception of a great circle of harmony encompasses these three seas. China will not be full until those seas are China's lakes. The 18th century was, in some ways, the Chinese century. Uh, the Qing dynasty had reached the, not the extent of civilization for China, but the extent of territorial uh, expansion. And, but, of course, the second half of the 19th century and first half of the 20th century, 1840 to 1949, the Chinese see as the century of humiliation. And they also see the second half of the 20th century and the first half of the 21st century, i.e. 1949 up to, uh, and not too far away from a Chinese perspective, 2049, as the century of restoration or redemption. 2049, the end of the century of redemption, 
which brings to an end the results of the century of humiliation, 2049 is a crucial date in time for the Chinese conception of the fulfillment of China's destiny in reclaiming all of its uh, appropriate territories, including those seas. China can therefore be seen as an irresistible force expanding to at least the first island chain. But of course, there's also not just a China destiny concept governing this uh, uh, part of the world, but there's an American legacy concept. It's been 70 years since the end of the Pacific War. Uh, and the Americas and the Navy's legacy from the Pacific War, the greatest wa uh, war in America's Navy history, the very war that produced an admiral whose auditorium we sit in at this moment, that war, that war is part of American identity and American Naval identity. The legacy of that war was to have maritime supremacy in the Western Pacific, including those re re uh, three littoral seas, codified in an alliance system already of 60 years duration, i.e. Japan, South Korea, uh, the Philippines, and the more complicated case with Taiwan. In that sense, at least from the point of view of identity and mentality and legacy, the U.S. is an immovable object in the first island chain, and even in the three seas. Insisting upon access, even to the point of defending the islets of our allies, such as the Spratleys in the Philippines and the South China Sea, and the, uh, the Senkakus, Dairus, as the Chinese call it, of the Japanese in the East China Sea. Their means, therefore, is impending a collision between the irresistible force and the immovable object. Or, as uh, Christopher Lane pointed out, two bodies cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Given this impending collision, uh, what are the alternatives from the United States? Well, we heard of some of these alternatives in our discussions. The first alternative, the alternative that we are today engaged in, is first to maintain commitments while decreasing U.S. capabilities, and even while the Chinese are increasing their capabilities. Continued commitments and decreased capabilities produce the Lipman Gap that Colin Derrick talked about. We've been there before. We've even been there for in the Western Pacific. We've even been there in the, in the South China Sea. The Lipman Gap, first case study from the point of view of Lipman, was the U.S. and the Philippines. The gap between our commitments to the Philippines and our capability there was amply demonstrated in 1941, and especially in 1942 at Bataan and Corregidor. There was a similar gap with the British in exactly the same place. Their, their commitments to their ter colonial territories in East Asia, especially Malaya and its base Singapore, vastly exceeded its capabilities. And thus it was. On December 10, 1941, the Prince of Wales and Repulse, the two grand uh, capital ships of the Royal Navy, and that was about all they had uh, in, in that part of the world, were caught at, uh, in the South China Sea by Japanese uh, land-based aircraft that uh, Professor Yoshihara mentioned today, uh, and were sunk to, and brought to the bottom. When you have a gap, especially a widening gap, between commitments and uh, credibilities, this is extremely dangerous and reckless and it will be dangerous in the future. The danger is reinforced within the last two years or so by the recent, recent stretching by U.S. officials of the U.S.-Japanese Security Treaty to cover the Senkakus or Dairus. Uh, Catlin Talmadge very eloquently etched out important details 
political details, strategic details, and legal details about that case. But there's a similar stretching uh, to have the U.S. Security uh, Treaty cover the Spratleys for the Philippines. And so, but we have no capability, uh, if it should ever come to a confrontation, uh, to really uh, do this in a very painless way. So that's a, the Lipman Gap is an extremely serious thing to avoid. Now, let me turn uh, briefly to another alternative, increased capabilities. This was what Professor Wolf, uh, 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 Wolf uh, uh, put forward. Well, we're trying that, so to speak. There's the pivot to Asia, in which we will now have 60% of our ships in, East Asia, in the Pacific and 40% elsewhere. But if we add them all up, at the end of the pivot, there will probably be fewer ships in the Pacific than there were at the beginning of the pivot. Second, the cooperative maritime strategy for the 21st century envisioned, this is only six years ago, a building the Navy to be hunt 313 ships. We're actually going in the opposite direction, shrinking the Navy uh, from the number of ships we had even in 2007 much less going to 313. That was considered by Admiral Mullen the minimal uh, uh, capability to, to carry out the cooperative maritime strategy. We have the air-sea battle concept, which has been excellently discussed by Carlisle Thayer. But of course, this is will issue, as Robert Art suggested, in a new arms race, a naval arms race, with the Chinese in that theater. And as Toshi Yoshihara has illustrated, the Chinese have more and more capacity to have denser and denser capability closer and closer to their mainland in those seas. And so, and in addition, as Kai Lieber pointed out, and as Carlisle Thayer has just pointed out, embedded in the air-sea battle concept as projected across those seas into the Chinese mainland is an escalatory dynamic. So with increased capabilities like that, the, this leads also to very grave dangers. In addition, if we bring in the analysis of uh, Christopher Lane and some others, uh, of course the, the uh, building capability to match that of required by the air-sea battle concept would require a very great increase in military spending. But I totally accept the analysis of Christopher Lane of the constraints on military spending. It's a major move politically when the pro-defense party, the Republican Party, splits into people who are defense hawks and who are fiscal hawks and oppose each other. And in that split, the Democratic Party, hardly the pro-defense party in the last uh, generation or so, therefore can get its way to cut defense spending, i.e. cut guns in favor of grandma as we heard in earlier discussions. So the political divisions in the Republican Party, the economic and demographic constraints almost guarantee that we will not have the money necessary to build the air-sea battle concept to what is required, just like we haven't had the money to build the cooperative maritime strategy of the 21st century to what it then defined was required. That leaves decreased commitments. Uh, well, there are major problems with this. Uh, there are major political constraints. Despite the fiscal hawks, there's a tremendous legacy within our uh, uh, foreign policy and strategic establishment, and quite rightly so, to maintain our treaty commitments. It would be extremely difficult to somehow formally and unilaterally break those treaty commitments, and yet if, we, if our capabilities begin to not be up to them, uh, we'll probably leave them in place rather than formally breaking them. And if we did break them, then there is the problem that at least South Korea and Japan, this was discussed earlier, are likely to reach for the nuclear weapon. And so therefore, that kind of decreasing commitment is not going to uh, solve our problems. There is one thing we can do. Following the analysis of uh, Catlin Talmage, we can clean up and clear up 
the commitments in awkward and ambiguous places, such as the Senkaku Dairus and such as the Spratly Islands. I don't have time to go into the details of, how, of what she said, that certain important distinctions between recognizing sovereignty, uh, being neutral on sovereignty, but recognizing administration, uh, certain analogies with Taiwan about uh, don't use uh, force and also uh, China and don't declare independence or don't do anything provocative, a lie. The, her distinctions are extremely important. I'm less confident that they can be box in the Chinese to get the result what we want. They're very good and subtle at being able to uh, undermine and outflank such distinctions. But certainly I think we should do what we can to clean that up. Um, but uh, given this rather grim prognosis, are there any ways out? Well, obviously, and Toshi Yoshihara suggested this this morning, one way is to look at the Chinese weaknesses, of which there are several, and I will very quickly just refer to what's been said by other panelists. First, there are the, um, the uh, what might be called the civilian or domestic weaknesses. These are the weaknesses that were identified, what might be called the internal contradictions of China, the very the uh, economic weaknesses, what the Chinese leadership itself calls the three inequalities between rich and poor, between uh, rural and uh, urban, between eastern uh, seaboard and western hinterland. Those three inequalities generate today so much discontent that there's more than 120,000 so-called mass demonstrations by official Chinese account. They're reinforced by corruption. They're reinforced by growing uh, resentment, uh, fear over pollution. Uh, and so there are those contradictions. In addition, uh, we heard from Robert Art of the middle income trap and of the demographic trap. So it, it could be that we could drop, uh, uh, we could uh, uh, draw a leaf from the Chinese understanding of strategy. Patience and persistence, wait them out. Well, if we just wait long enough, maybe the Chinese internal contradictions will solve all the problems that I've just been delineating. In some ways, that's what we did with the Soviet Union. We waited and waited, however, of course, having a strong military force, especially in that last decade where we finally reaped the fruits of that waiting with a strong military force, uh, that could well happen. Of course, the Chinese are well aware of this, and so they are, trying to overcome the political discontent with developing this new ideology of kind of neo-Confucian uh, uh, political theory and a kind of na Chinese national identity. And that in turn is more likely to drive them to fulfilling China's destiny in those three littoral seas. Finally, there are the weaknesses that were identified this morning, operational weaknesses of the Chinese military in anti-ship and anti-mine warfare. We can take advantage of those, although they will probably not be strategic game changers. But there is also a strategic weakness, which the air-sea battle has begun to glimpse with this conception of a distant blockade to take advantage of the Moroccan dilemma and the fact that the Chinese economy today, and therefore the legitimacy of the regime today, requires a vast import of raw materials, most obviously petroleum, but not only that, not only through the th three littoral seas, but through the Straits of Malacca, and there through their Indian Ocean and beyond. And even if the United States uh, should eventually have to live with some denial, at least the capability of denial of access by the Chinese to the three littoral seas. For every move of denial that they put against us, we can trump them tit for tat by denying a comparable access in the Indian Ocean as long as we do maintain our maritime supremacy there. And I do believe that we can continue to have global maritime leadership and even supremacy in the oceans and in most of the seas, uh, even if we should have to yield 
for global, uh, for maritime supremacy within those three littoral seas. But that doesn't mean that we would put up with them denying access. It means that every time they denied access there, we would respond not so much with a frontal assault on them with the air-sea battle, but with a flank assault, a distant blockade. So that I've said more than enough. I will now conclude because time is precious and, and the questions I know are coming, but uh, also the, the students will be going. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Kurth. Uh, let's uh, open the floor up for questions. Any questions? <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Brad Cowan versus uh, U.S. Navy. I know uh, we have to ask at least two before the uh, Admiral will let us leave. Uh, I've got one uh, saved up on uh, air-sea battle. Um, as a naval aviator, I get pretty emotional when I'm told that uh, I myself can't really do my job, so we come up with uh, concepts to, uh, you know, as a joint force, be able to uh, get places to uh, ensure freedom of action. Uh, today, air-sea battle was mentioned several times, and uh, two points really resonate with me. One was the comment that the uh, higher-level civilian leaders, upon its being published, had a very negative reaction, saying basically that the concept wasn't properly vetted. And then Professor Thayer's comments, really that the, the allies that the concept was designed to defend publicly state that they really wouldn't support it. So my question is, does the air-sea battle concept point to a mismatch between U.S. foreign policy and what we're here to talk about, uh, grand strategy? That's actually your question. Okay. <clears throat> well, I think I, I try to address that by saying that, from, at least from an Australian perspective, uh, it, it helps stabilize deterrence at a time the Chinese Navy is demonstrating greater power. That's, that's a stabilizing factor, that China has to put that in, into, the, into their box and think about it. At the same time, uh, we don't want to then be seen as opposing China, and, and, you know, containing it or, or planning on a conflict with it. We need to draw it out. And that's going to be a long process. America's been trying it forever. China keeps coming up with three obstacles. Australia's trying trilateral exercises as a, as a way of bridging the gap. Uh, in other words, but we, we need uh, the, the U.S. I haven't talked about rebalancing, but I think the whole thing has been resold. And in the region, we understand. You, I keep hearing the word pivot here. I was told it's banned in Washington. It's rebalancing. And it got an overwhelming military edge. What we're looking at is the economic and other, and the engagement, the deep engagement, which hasn't been mentioned, to pull China out. It was already mentioned by Sir Hugh this morning that uh, Australia, our largest trading partner, is China. We don't want to make that choice. We don't think we, we argue in our white paper. We don't have to. That's bad strategy. We can trade with China, and we can have the United States as our major ally. We can build up capability, because at the same time as you engage, we must also be able to stand up or resist when core values or access to the global commons are being threatened. So it's the strategy has to be to use the, the, the lever and the brake uh, continually. So as a U.S. mismatch, yes, I think we've heard from more than just Australia, an American based in Australia. Uh, we've heard from other speakers here today with much more prominent access to Washington, uh, a greater need to articulate a grand strategy, and then particularly for the Asia Pacific, one that addresses the concerns. They have to live with China. The U.S. is a resident power. How can we bring it out and work with it? So yes, the mismatch is that the U.S. policy hasn't risen to that higher level to articulate a strategy that makes us feel comfortable. How do you deal with the growing Chinese power? But China is going to be continually economically more powerful, more dependent on the sea, as it, as economy grows, and how how do we make it? See, it also has a, an interest in guarding the global commons and cooperating, and, and in involving itself in multilateral institutions. So it's to articulate a strategy like that that other states could feel comfortable with, and then if they don't want to formally sign on and say we support an air-sea battle, as the advice was from the Australian think tank, but nonetheless continue to work with the U.S. and develop those, those capabilities. Uh, so have a bob either way, not antagonizing China. And the U.S. is clear, that's why I started out quoting. It's not aimed at a particular region, it's global. 
other A2, AD threats. It's not identifying a specific country. Other people are putting words in it. That's dangerous. That's Dick Diamond, I've been doing uh, a lot of wargaming from the very beginning on air-sea battle. And we were discouraged at first that you don't want to go there. Uh, a lot of that's been documented, that you're going to have to go into areas that are enemy can range with their fires. You have to reload under fire. You have to go with ships and fight uh, missile defense battles against thousands of missiles with only a few missiles on board, and you have to go thousands of miles and reload under fire to come back to the fight. So the last couple of games we've had, we said, we know how to do this, we won't go there. We'll just do a distant blockade. Well, let me tell you, that's not as easy as it sounds. Because a lot of things have changed since the golden age of sail and British mercantilism. <clears throat> Uh, you bring in economic experts that tell you that the cargoes of ships, particularly ships carrying energy products, may change nationalities and ownerships 20 or 30 times in a voyage. So if you clear somebody through the Straits of Malacca, but then they sell the fuel to China a couple miles beyond, you end up in this impossible position of you have to escort or arrest every ship on the ocean the U.S. Navy has not built a navy that's suitable for massive interdiction, and then you bring in the global warming part of the future of maybe energy coming over the pole as well as through these southern approaches to China, and you just don't have, you know, aid, using Aegis cruisers and aircraft carriers is not a good way to run a blockade. The distant blockade turns out to be very difficult, and you end up, to make it effective, having to get closer and closer to the ports where the products are going to end up. And guess what? That's also in range of those missiles. So, so far, maybe this is smarter guys that can do it different, but everybody thought distant blockade was the answer, but it was a lot tougher when you get down to actual scenarios. I certainly concede that it's a lot tougher than just the phrases and the, um, uh, the few minutes that I took to that. And I certainly agree that it, too, should be gamed, uh, uh, including right here, uh, and gamed repeatedly to see all sorts of particular iterations. Uh, I also agree with you uh, uh, that a distant blockade, like virtually, like also in its own way, uh, a direct air-sea battle, or virtually any other uh, maritime operational doctrine, will require changes in ship force structure to more fine-tune the capability. So I'm agreeing with all of you, uh, agreeing with all the difficulties uh, that you uh, uh, said. I, uh, then the only case I would make would be that, well, it's pro despite the difficulties, the effort to do it to test it out, see if it can be done, that is, I mean, through the gaming, uh, uh, and then ultimately, if necessary, uh, in the real world, it's better than the alternatives. <clears throat> yeah, if I could just join in, there's some very interesting case studies in both the world wars, when the British took control of the world shipping system, and with the support of the major neutral shipper, the United States, um, invented a system of shipping control in which the United States agreed to certificate every cargo leaving the US as to its final destination. So instead of the British having to stop every ship, they were able to uh, just stop the ones that had leaked through the system. It is possible to do this, but the problem in the 21st century is that ownership and title and legal rights are much more complex. So it, it would be more difficult, and the legal difficulties, I think, would be particularly significant. Uh, but China's dependency, not just on fossil fuels, but on something as fundamental as soya bean, uh, is so extreme uh, that it will be very, very quickly effective. Uh, China buys most of its soybean from Brazil. That gives you an awful lot of opportunities to stop that soybean leaving Brazil. The best way would be preemptive purchase. Uh, if you go to Brazil and buy their bean, then it's not going to get to China. You know? That's how the British conducted a lot of their blockade in the First World War. They didn't stop ships. They bought the ships and the cargoes on the high seas and redeploy them for their own purpose. So you will have to get used to eating soya bean if you want to fight the Chinese. <laughs> uh, great, thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Holzer. I'm from Boston. And this is a little bit of a different type of question. Um, 
But, you know, uh, with, um, let's see, the, um, I'm trying to think of the right way to put this, with the uh, development of China over the years, as we all know, you know, with growth in China, with transportation and commerce, um, we're aware of that. And in the context of history with um, changes that have occurred, popular changes, uprisings, so the Arab Spring is one example, and the fall of the Warsaw Pact, you know, is another example, let's say in the past quarter century. Um, what happened to like Tiananmen Square, you know, the popular uprising then, and how that's changed over the recent time with uh, the growth of China what I'm wondering is whether um, that growth has muted any popular changes in society or whether um, there still is sort of an undercurrent of dissatisfaction and we could see at some point in China what occurred, let's say, with the Arab Spring. Yes, well, as it happened, um, that particular question that you just asked is a question that uh, the Chinese leadership have been asking and systematically answering ever since Tiananmen Square. And their initial uh, and continuing right down to the present answer to your question was that to prevent Tiananmen Squares, i.e. Uh, large demonstrations especially, uh, I mean the mass demonstrations actually are relatively small, more, uh, something like more, anything uh, uh, more than 50 or 60 in a village. But in a village that's a mass demonstration. But to really have mass demonstrations in Beijing, they want to prevent that sort of thing of course. Or for that matter just many, many, many mass demonstrations elsewhere. And the decision they made obviously was to uh, uh, put emphasis on two new sources of legitimacy. The central one was economic growth. That makes them relentless, even maniacal, to continue economic growth and explains why we often get other oddities from Chinese economic policy. They believe they have to continue to do that. And of course, that is one of their weaknesses, not only domestically, but because it means they require all the raw materials for that. Uh, and within that, they're very uh, allergic to inflation. And every once in a while, they begin to lose control of that, like with the, um, the uh, local credit, uh, the local governments giving too much credit. That's occurring now. And so they do have their points of vulnerability, but they're very conscious of this, and they have systematic studies of it. It happened that a few years ago, I was in China as a guest of the International Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and I was astonished how well informed they were on what are the economic underpinnings uh, and the political underpinnings for the end of authoritarian regimes. Uh, the top officials had knowledge comparable to a PhD candidate in the United States. Uh, the second legitimating principle they have, of course, is uh, Chinese nationalism, or that is say, uh, China as a civilizational nation, an even grander nation than those Western nations. And of course, that is the, the conjunction of the, uh, of the growing economy and of the national ideology is designed to capture the middle class and the children of the middle class to be firmly behind the Communist Party as at least the best alternative. And thus, thus far they are fairly successful. Those are weaknesses, but they are weaknesses that actually causes us some problems because their very focus on nationalism causes this kind of sense of completing the hundred years of redemption. And the very emphasis on economic growth means their insistence on building up a blue water navy in the longer run so they can even solve the Malacan dilemma. Uh, I believe we have time for one last question. A few minutes, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Margaret Reed, and uh, I'm a distance learning student, sir, so hopefully that checks the box. Um, so for, um, we've heard several times that we don't really have a grand strategy right now and that the strategy that we do have is based on f uh, financial constraints or political constraints, um, but there also seems to be an agreement that we need a grand strategy. So how do you see us getting from where we are to where we need to be? Mm -hmm. 
that's probably for all three of us, but I'm willing to answer it. But uh, perhaps the others would like to say something. Yeah. The question is essentially how do we get from where we are today without a grand strategy to having one? Um, I turn the question around. Uh, I think it's understanding what the principles on which any strategic response will be based. The United States is not planning to invade somebody else's country. It's not planning to declare war on China. You don't need that kind of strategy. You know, th those classical old strategies where you plan down to the last uh, uh, ammunition round how you're going to wage war, the, the Schlieffen Plan of 1914, classic example. And um, these are military solutions to political problems. The problems we're dealing with are not military, they're political and economic. Uh, and having a grand strategy which predicates a military solution uh, ends up becoming self-fulfilling prophecy. The critical thing is to have the capability to respond to whatever threatens your vital national interests. So first of all, what are they? Uh, secondly, what are you prepared to fight for and what are you not prepared to fight for? What is vital? What would you give up if you had to? Uh, what would you trade for things that you think are more important? Uh, thirdly, what is it about this country that you particularly think is important? What are the values that make this country different? Uh, we most of us know what they are from outside or inside, but again, they're different to the ones in China. The Chinese have a different set of mm -hmm. values, uh, and there's a possibility of a clash over those values. So it's avoiding getting prescriptive. Uh, a very great uh, 19th century uh, admiral in Britain famously said, you know, if I know what your strategy is, I will beat you because once your strategy is out there, I can get to work on it. A small child will beat a chess grandmaster if the grandmaster has only one game plan. <laughs> you know? So you've, you've got to be flexible, and it's flexibility. It's in intelligent, sophisticated, uh, resourceful flexibility that is successful. The best plan in the world does not survive first contact with the enemy. Clausewitz, 101, uh, and he's right. Where did Clausewitz learn this? When the best army in Europe, as far as he went, uh, fought the battle with the French, they didn't lose, they got annihilated. By the end of the day, he was a prisoner of war and his dreams came crashing down and he spent the next 20 odd years writing a great book to try and understand what on earth had happened to the 18th century army of Frederick the Great. And in the process, he helps us to understand a lot. But he says, there are no lessons, we learn by understanding the past and we think about it. Do not take the past onto the battlefield or into the strategy room. What would Napoleon do? Well, he wouldn't do what we're about to do. He wouldn't say, what would somebody else do? He would say, I'm going to do this. My intuition, my judgment, my perspective on this is we have to get a grip on the principles, and from those principles, we can deduce the strategy we need when or if those challenges come. If the Chinese are going to do this, how would we begin to think about a response? We will have time to do that. It's not gonna to happen tomorrow. And my reading of China is that their internal concerns will always trump their external ambitions. Mm -hmm. If we don't stop them getting uh, into the world and doing that trade, they will almost certainly not um, turn hostile. We need to think about what would happen if they did, that's just sound planning, but we need not to send them the message that that is what we are planning to do. And there's a danger with air, land, battle, or any other strategic concept, rather like new maritime strategy. I'm old enough to remember new maritime strategy fundamentally destabilizing. It ended up working, but not because it was good strategy, but because, in fact, it was bad strategy. Uh, and it terrified the Russians, and their response was to spend a lot of money, and that was the end of them. Uh, I don't think the Chinese will do that. So we need to be very clear that it's about having a, a very sound understanding <coughs> of what the vital issues are, and the principles on which any response will be based, and having the capacity to respond, and setting that level of capacity. So a lot of this debate has been about capacity. If you have enough capacity, you can respond. You need to have a clear sense of what you're going to have to do, but it, it's the endless conundrum of defense in a democratic state. It's something Mahan talks about all the time. I don't think democracies have the willpower to sustain this level of defense that they need into the long term. They will let it slide and the authoritarian, the autocratic states will take over. Fortunately for us, he was wrong on that. I'll try to be very brief. Australia just went through two exercises and released a, a white paper on Australia in the Asian century uh, that covered every sector of society and Australia's interest to develop a roadmap of increasing our Asian literature, et cetera. Secondly, the defense white paper, and of course the opposition says as soon as it's elected, it'll produce its own. Uh, those are pl planning documents that set 
yeah, having been outside the United States, well, this is the third trip this year, uh, it's the lack of bipartisanship. So one is a kind of leadership, retired uh, good heads and thinkers, strategic thinkers to lead a national effort to get consensus on exactly the vital national interests, the values the United States wants to do, uh, the capacity and the funding for it. In very broad, very broad terms. It's something that the, the, the President and Congress could sign off on uh, and, and have it bipartisan and not get it so prescriptive that it, it falls apart. But those broader things that set out the relationships with other major powers and, and section by regions so Asia, Europe, uh, etc. So not that you need to replicate the Australian model, but in other words, that, that was a, a way of, it brought in all parties, it brought in all sectors of business, academia, and any other interest group that felt they had an interest in Asia to contribute. And that was a, and, and it's not a grand strategy for the world, but it was a grand strategy for Australia and Asia. And that kind of approach, I think bipartisan, old heads uh, could help. Great. I think that that was a great question. It's a great way to wrap up this panel and the conference by coming back to the issue of grand strategy. Will you please help me thank the panelists? Thank you.